Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This is S4A live stream number 106, being recorded on September 7. The hell year is it? 2023. Okay, good for me. I remembered what year it is. So with me in the chat are 41 people at twitch.tv slash socialism S4A, where we do these things. Uh, we used to do them weekly or even twice a week. I kind of took a lot of the summer off, and I think... Uh, behind that was a sort of restructuring of the way I approach this channel that was sort of going on in the back of my mind uh, without me fully realizing it. But we're back and we're doing some streams and I think this might become a weekly thing again. So if you are on Twitch, go give a follow, twitch.tv slash socialism S4A. So what we're going to talk about in today's stream, we got a few stories um, in the last stream, which hasn't been posted on the YouTube yet. We talked about um, the looming crisis in the U.S., the looming economic crisis. I believe in the next one to three, definitely by three years, but I think one in the next one to two years, there will be not so much a repeat or a replay, but a reemergence of the same fundamental problems that caused the 2008 uh, global financial meltdown. I think that Basically, uh, the U.S. and other central banks, but especially the U.S., bought time, but they didn't really fix anything that much. And it looks to me like the mechanisms that they used to buy that time bought them about 15, 16 years. And now it is possible that it is um, coming to a close and it's going to crash again anyway. And unless they pull some kind of brand new trick uh, that you know is, has never been done before, just as quantitative easing as such had never been done before, uh, then I think that they are shit out of luck, which means we all are shit out of luck because it's going to take the entire economy, you know, the way that goods and services are produced and uh, consumed, you know, the way that we get stuff done is going to go with it. There probably will be a credit crunch, basically complete paralysis of lending, and I don't even know if the Fed is going to have tools at that point um, to even do anything about it. So anyway, we were talking about that in the last stream. I'm also going to be recording, by the time this is posted, a web supplement um, or an offline supplement that basically in the stream itself, I realized I had way too much information. And usually I pull some stories for these streams and I have some rough idea of what I'm doing and there's some notes. I pulled way too much information and it just didn't really gel quite the way that I wanted to in the last stream while we were rolling live. So I'm going to record that offline and then, so we'll post 105, we will post the offline supplement to 105 in which I go into my case for why 2008 is going to, you know, it's been suppressed for 15 years. I think it's going to come back again and it's going to hurt worse than before. Um, that would be my opinion and sort of why that is and what we can do about it. I mean, I don't think we'll be able to change it, but how should we position ourselves as socialists politically uh, in anticipation of that? So we'll have some discussion of that. But I have an article about uh, basically more capitalist delusion that they can uh, have deflation without any problems. We'll look at that. There is, as we mentioned in the last stream, uh, RICO case being built against the Stop Cop City protesters in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. We're going to look at some stuff about Russia doesn't seem to be doing so well. We have not supported at any point the Russian invasion of Ukraine. This is an inter-imperialist conflict. Absolutely. And don't listen to anybody who tells you otherwise. Um, I think that this is the Russian bourgeoisie trying to, you know, slam their fist on the table and be taken seriously. It's not working out. Their currency is going down the tubes again. And uh, there's all kinds of other stuff. We'll look at several data points from that. And then closely related to that, you know, in BRICS, the R stands for Russia. Um, a lot of the people who are into the whole multipolarity, you know, liberal theory of uh, a peaceful multipolar capitalist world um, are fans of BRICS. BRICS, of course, being a term for emerging capital markets that was coined by an analyst at Goldman Sachs. That's where BRICS came from. These countries don't really have that much in common politically, except that they all trade in a major way with China. That's kind of the only thing that unites them. 
Um, so you get a lot of people out there who are revisionist and anti-social revolution, and they're like, BRICS is going to make a new currency, and this is going to bring down the U.S., and, you know, it could do that, except there's no real signs right now that they are doing a currency or anything like that. So this right now is just sort of fantasy and speculation, but we'll read a couple of articles related to that and have some discussion of that. So uh, where are we in the chat right now? 43 people. All right, so yeah, chat, uh, post your comments, and then I will read through a lot of the stuff. We'll come back to the chat and uh, close the stream with that. So before we do anything else today, uh, the top link on the graphic that we usually run, there is patreon.com slash socialism for all. And what I would like to do to start out today's stream is give a bit more of a tribute to the patrons than usual. So I did update this. Takes Patreon a few days at the beginning of the month to sort of uh, sort out who is still a patron and who changed their level. And anyway, this is updated now. And we have three blue names. So blue names are people who started supporting in September 2020 or earlier. So they are now into their fourth year. They've been supporting for three years. And that's Reverend Lawn Gnome Hollywood, Dan Sullivan, and Hataka. Thank you very much. You know, I was telling the chat um, before we started rolling, we were chatting for about a half an hour here. And, um, you know, I was talking about how I started out as a commenter who just wanted to read some more Marx, and I had things to say, and I started making videos. But, you know, you all out there as other learning Marxists and people who comment on stuff on the Internet and support people doing what I'm doing and we interact on social media, you know, I appreciate you, and I come to... Uh, see your screen names and whatever as familiar uh, people who show up and are genuinely into this and supportive I really like uh, your presence and appreciate it so you know it's not something I'm cynical about I do really like seeing those names uh, you know month after month it's good to know that there is some kind of thread uh, that's consistent throughout this thing and we do have a lot of um, recurring supporters so those three names are the ones that are now in blue and then to give a shout out also to the ones in green who've been supporting for over two years. Amante A, Arnie, um, I'm of course going to mispronounce a lot of these and you can correct me later, I don't mind at all. In fact, I'd like to know how do you pronounce your screen name in some cases, which may be your actual name. Uh, Blind Max, Comrade Azriel, Constraint Automaton, DB, Dope Wizard Comrade, scanning for the next green name, Jake Forrest, Jared, John Warren, Joseph Yutley, is it Jutley or Yutley? Uh, Matthew O'Neill, RNL, Senyato, Tokarev309, John, John Trimbath, Kai Boyd, Matthew F., William Yexen. I don't know how you pronounce the, um, oh, sorry, Vilheim. Is it Yexen? I don't know how you pronounce the A with the uh, pointy thing over it. Daniel Hyman, and Silver Oak are in the green tier. Uh, that's, you know, really what I like to look at is like, you know, how long have you been supporting? I think it reflects well on the community that people have, you know, stuck around for a long time. And then um, the names in yellow have been supporting for over a year. And, uh, you know, some of these might be close to the two year, they just haven't crossed it yet. These include Aaron Evans, Alex Rose, RB Yarby, Bass Playing Kami, C Blaze, Chaos Druid, Communism is the Only Way, Damnation Daniel, Dr. Gonzo 420, Film Four Brains, Ganesh Taylor, Ian Sherwood, Ill State Fishing, Jameson McKee, Jared Bohm, Jasmine, Jules Taylor, Matthew Wade, Michael, MLM Lover, Noah Jackson, Nuka Dirtbag, Ryan Marr, Scrumpy, Space Cat Tabby, The Real Joey Steele, Toker Face, Yair Cabral, Alexander Uchi, Brock Barber, Crowbar, Heavy Dukes 22, Hog Wrangler, Kentucky Radical, Kyle Chason, uh, Maria, I put your name in Greek and I can't read it. Anyway, Maria from Greece, um, I can almost see your name because you write your name uh, in the Roman alphabet and Cremita, right, is your name? Okay, Maria Cremita, there we go. Marxist Potato, I just, I, I'm always reluctant to like guess at people's names that I've been interacting with but like don't have in front of me. I must say that's another thing doing this channel has made me enormously self-conscious, which is good in a way, 
um, because it means that I care about accuracy, but it's also um, a bit of a strain at times, at times. You know, you're putting stuff online and obviously communists in particular, are a very, very critical bunch. Uh, but I, I found uh, doing the channels made me very self-conscious. It just means I'm trying to uphold a, a high standard, but also means that I wind up like really um, double and triple checking every single thing I say. And I don't, you know, if there's something I'm not sure of, I don't like to say it. But anyway, I think I remembered in the process to a point where I was confident uh, actually saying it out loud. All right. Little bit of a window inside my mind there. Marxist potato, Mikhail Krupa. Occult Demon Cassette, Simon Denny, Terrer, Uminya Krisnetti, Unique Name Here X, Wobbly Joe, Zay Collins, Austin Brutcher, BC, Be Kind, Black Bolshevik, Ian Snyder, Lucas Colburn, Lump and Line Cook, Mutated Wisdom, Nathan Bohm. Is Nathan Bohm on here twice? No, there's Jared Bohm. That's what it is. Okay, I knew there was another Bohm. Rose Red Flechette, Simon Knight, Andrew Souza, Jeffrey Lenantine, LDP, oh, LPDE04, Sparrow, Wojekt, and Citizen Smith. And then many more names at the less than a year level. And you know what? Let's just read them too. Because a lot of these people actually have been around for a while. A Person, Braden Siemens, Captain Kami, Clint Wink. I'm not sure how to say that. Comrade Zero, Crudux Cruo, Darlene Pagano, Empy Doodle, Errol Peterson, Exploding Turtle, Felix Lewis Hammerlink, Gabrielle, Gary the Gray, or is that Gabriel? Jack, Ben Cuman, Jonathan Roman, Joseph DiGiorgio, Casey, Kevin Kirby, Leah Liu, Libak, Lefty in Training, Lemur, Matthew Pershing, MJ Andrea, Nathan G, Nick M, Per Tenebras, Ray Rasa, Robbo, Ruan, Sasha Zaramesia. There we go. Sean Atkinson, Seth Lambert, Shannon, Tanner Reamer, Tom DeAngelis, Thomas Olszewski, Ashley S., Bolshevik Bremi, Christiander, El Perro Asalariado, Amir Scrielli, Forrest Staub, Gabriel Glykwhite, Gabriel Reed, Hale Zeus, Hobo Bastard, Hunter Thompson, It's Lennon Time, Jake Ichikawa, Jesus Christ, glad to have your support, John Meyer, Liquidated Bourgeoisie, Mark Granado, Michael Brown, Petunia, Riley Ridgeback, Ross Butts, Stalin's Humongous Spoon, Stephen Castalea, Stephen Elliott, Tobias Reaper, Tuca, Daniel Hemphill, M. Pugin, John Cathcart, Kyle Tebelman, Nova, Patrice, Tristan, Philip Smith, The Buckless Prophet, and Anonymous. So yeah, um, I appreciate the community. I don't say it enough. I mean, I do say it, but it's, uh, you know, um, just good to see people actually interested in this stuff and supporting continuously over time. It makes it more rewarding for me, and I don't just mean because you're supporting on Patreon. I mean, seeing people consistently showing up, it's like, oh, we must be doing something uh, reasonably valuable here. So that is really good. And, you know, I'm sure you all are doing important stuff out in your communities. And um, it's just good to know uh, that uh, there is, you know, some sort of a network sort of building and whatnot. So wanted to give more of a shout out than usual to uh, the patrons. And, you know, won't be doing that every stream, but I did want to uh, tip the hat a little bit further uh, this time. Also, I want to do a quick reminder. We did a little bit more of a Biobot rundown in the last stream, but I did want to just give a quick PSA. We are in a surge. Mask up, avoid crowds, etc. We're back to February levels of COVID. And COVID, it's not just a question of, you know, but did you die? Well, even if you don't die, even mild COVID can cause brain damage, brain shrinkage, um, lots of, uh, I'll put the thing that I was put here. There you go. Even mild COVID-19 can cause your brain to shrink. Recent brain imaging shows that the disease can cause physical changes equivalent to a decade of aging and trigger problems with attention and memory. They say exactly why it's still a mystery. That's sort of subject of ongoing research. But uh, COVID effect infects, not affect, well, does affect, but it affects by infecting any tissue in your body basically that has ACE2 receptors, 
which includes basically all of your major organs. So your brain, heart, lungs, liver, kidneys, male reproductive system, on and on. It can also infect T cells, major component of your immune system, and it can deplete and wear out your immune system, leaving you more vulnerable both to infectious disease from without, and also your T cells are involved in neutralizing cancers and things in your body from within. So you need your T cells, you need your heart, you need your lungs, you need your brain, all that stuff. Every time you get infected with COVID, you're usually suffering some kind of organ damage and upping your odds of really bad health outcomes. So don't get COVID. And again, just to look at that on the um, six month view to zoom in. So we're way back into like, uh, you know, early to mid February levels again and rising. <clears throat> By the time you get to 800, you're in a full on surge. This is the wastewater levels and we're over 600 and rising. Every region is a little bit different. Most of them are pretty close on this and every county is a little bit different. So do check biobot.io, B-I-O-B-O-T.io slash data and you can stay current. You can check out, not every county is on there, but you can check out how your state's doing and things like that. Um, but yeah, COVID is not over and people need to be masking. Schools are back in session. Schools are one of the main drivers of infection. And with them back in session, this thing is going to take off. And then there's going to be more indoor air as people move in uh, to closed air in the late fall. So PSA, COVID is still raging. And, um, you know, be on the lookout and uh, protect yourself and protect your loved ones and, you know, people you live with, even if you don't love them. Um, because you're breathing the same air. There's the regional breakdown as well. All right. Uh, because, yeah, e even, even if you wish them harm, you know, if you infect them, they can then reinfect you. So it's really, you know, enlightened self-interest tells you uh, don't get COVID, don't spread COVID. It's really bad. All right. So as I was saying, uh, with that out of the way, we are doing an offline supplement to sort of clarify why I think 2008 is coming back in the next one to three years and it's going to be a disastrous shit show uh i mean yeah i mean even bernie sanders was saying back in 2016 the institutions that were too big to fail in 2008 are bigger now and guess what that hasn't changed since 2016 it, that process still rolls on when the pain comes it's going to be i think blinding it's going to be like nothing before so do check out that supplemental video. That'll be on the channel by the time that I post this. Um, I'm hoping to post this Saturday. So there's that. But um, speaking of the sort of delusion that supporters of the current system are in about, you know, prices can just stay high forever. This isn't a bubble. This is just the new normal. This is exactly what people were saying before 2008. Like, when are you going to learn? And it's not just 2008. It's like before every crash. But we're now in a sort of very, very late, you know, maybe terminal phase of the system. But here's an example. So this is from CNN Business. Immaculate disinflation is the new economic buzzword. And thanks to a patron for sending this in. But what does it mean? This is by Elizabeth Buchwald. Um, and it is from yesterday. Economists added yet another term to their lexicon in recent months. I guess maybe to confuse people. Immaculate disinflation. Again, I think file this under poorly aged things in advance because I think that's where this is headed. While there's no official definition of immaculate disinflation, the phrase is being used to describe a scenario where inflation cools without causing a spike in unemployment. Yeah, no, that's not really it. Historically, that's been difficult, if not impossible, to pull off because of a well-studied phenomenon known as the sacrifice ratio. The theory behind the ratio equation is that every reduction in inflation inflicts a certain degree of pain on an economy. That pain tends to come in the form of a higher unemployment rate, which hampers economic growth. So again, you know, going back to Marx, it's been shown, uh, I mean, even by the end of the 19th century, even by the mid 19th century, this was very clear. Capitalism was a relatively new system at that time, but already people who were studying it noticed that, hey, there's this thing where it breaks down, you know, every few years regularly. And sometimes there will be a longer period and sometimes there will be a shorter period. Look at uh, recently posted on the channel Rosa Luxemburg's Reform or Revolution. 
She discusses this at length and in a very concise and powerful way. Um, this is just what capitalism does. There are crises of overproduction. The system breaks down. It basically gets too big for its britches and it sets in motion a whole series of events, part of which is workers being thrown out into the streets because they need to let production cool off for a while. Um, this is why we can never really attain more than a certain amount of prosperity at any given time in capitalism. We need to move on into socialism for that. The only way you can do that is social revolution. That's the only way to end capitalism. It doesn't end itself on its own, and it doesn't end by um, you know, reformist measures either. You really can't reform your way out of capitalism. That's been theorized since the beginning, and there are clear reasons for stating that. And in practice, it's never been done either. So it seems like the theory is indeed correct. However, you can uh, revolt your way out of it and, um, and have a social revolution and then institute a replacement system. And historically, that is the duty of the working class to do that. Capitalism over time trends towards more and more instability and finally a massive crisis from which it really can't recover. At which point, if you still want a functioning economy, you still want to be able to produce and you know circulate goods and and all of that kind of stuff then you need a different system not capitalism anymore because it can just only go to a certain point beyond that it has no future it dies and it just leaves chaos in its wake unless we the proletarian class of dispossessed wage workers that is produced by capitalism we take it over and we impose a new system and the name of that system is socialism so anyway Capitalists just trying to delude themselves. We're now in the 21st century and they're still trying to pretend that, you know, the boom bust cycle is not a thing. It's hilarious. I mean, it would be if it wasn't so sad. They're like drug addicts just chasing the short term profits. And as long as they're getting that, everything's fine. And then when it dries up, as it does, you know, every decade or so, uh, they start wailing like infants who have no understanding or context of anything that's happening. You know, we can't leave these people in charge of, of the economy. Anyway, in the United States, inflation cooled from a peak of 9.1% in June 2022. It's pretty high. Uh, the target of the Fed is 2%, so just for reference. In June 2022 to 3.2% in July of this year, according to the latest Consumer Price Index. However, not, not all prices have come down really fully, and there's a lot still yet to crash. We're looking at the housing market in particular. Uh, housing prices are, I mean, this is a, an expensive staple item that's a basic necessity. Prices are still at all-time highs and are about to crash, and that's going to cause massive ripple effects through the economy. But anyway, yet the nation's unemployment rate actually fell in June 2022 to 3.5% in July 2023. The current rate is 3.8 percent. That's leading some economists to believe that immaculate disinflation may be possible, except time out. You're looking at one month's data that, you know, some of this may be lagging and that's not enough to base a theory on. That's pure wishful thinking, like I said, fantasy and delusion. Um, in fact, what just started happening is in, uh, unemployment had been falling for quite a while. And then it just recently started to turn around, like last month. And once it starts going up, it can shoot up really, really quickly. We also see uh, something closely related to the unemployment rate is the number of open jobs, job openings. Because um, as that shrinks, you're heading more towards a point where people who don't have work, you know, can't get hired. Anyway, that number is falling. The number of open jobs is falling. The unemployment rate is now starting to rise and so that's what you would expect and that is exactly what is starting to happen so this is pure bullshit and it's dangerous because you get people just believing this nonsense and then you know they're extra shocked when um, the bill comes due anyway but fed officials aren't likely to celebrate until they see inflation hit the central bank's two percent target and stay there for a sustained period getting there without a significant spike in unemployment would be close to a miracle. I mean, like they said, you know, miracle, impossible. Yeah, because that's just how it works. Getting there without a significant spike in unemployment would be close to a miracle, 
in the eyes of Fed Chair Jerome Powell. Which, by the way, I don't know if you've ever heard Jerome Powell speak, but um, the guy has a wonderful voice, I have to say. <laughs> I, he sounds like a like a you know like a computer voice almost. He's it's so smooth. It, you know, if he ever wanted to, and I say this as somebody who records audiobooks, he ever wanted to do audiobooks. I'm sure he'd do terrible, terrible, shitty audiobooks. Uh, but uh, what a voice! Anyway, um, in a speech last month, Powell said that reaching two percent will quote require a period of below trend economic growth. In June, he also said that, quote, the key to getting inflation down is to have, quote, continuing loosening in labor market conditions, a euphemism for more unemployment. And Wall Street loves this because as the job openings go down and as unemployment goes up, what else goes down? Wages, because labor has less power, uh, sort of nat natural power in the sense of unorganized labor has just sort of more power because labor's in um, when there's a uh, great need for labor when there's high demand then workers can uh, hold out because there's lots of job opportunities and employers have to be more competitive with the wages that they're offering as the need for labor goes down job opening job openings drop and the unemployment rate goes up workers get more desperate things start to favor the capitalists and they can offer less competitive wages and so on. So Wall Street's loving this right now. And there's an article about that in the uh, offline supplement uh, posted separately. But yeah, this is just always what happens. And the idea that it wouldn't happen this time for some reason is, is again, a dangerous fantasy. Uh, but finishing the article, even President Joe Biden's top economic advisor, Jared Bernstein, expressed skepticism about the term. Quote, I wouldn't call this disinflation immaculate. He said in a CNBC interview at last month's Jackson Hole Fed conference, there's a good question as to what's around the corner at the last mile. Yeah, like a reemergence of 2008. Bernstein and, uh, or Bernstein, sorry, I'm so used to Edward Bernstein, and his fellow White House economists also said in an August blog post that the deflation we're experiencing cannot be immaculate if, quote, what drove inflation up in the first place was disruptions to the economy's supply side. Rather, it is, quote, the unsnarling of formerly snarled supply chains that is bringing inflation down, they said. So the other thing is they're trying to raise interest rates. The Fed raising interest rates makes it more expensive to take out loans. And that may reduce, you know, get some more people thinking twice about can I afford to expand my business right now, you know, by taking out this loan to fund it and so on. People might, uh, you know, be more likely to just try to make do with what they've got rather than putting more money out into the system through the creation of loans as those loans become more expensive. Um, the Fed has raised rates significantly, but they're trying to hold steady for now. But that's just the interest rates. The other point that I was getting into in the offline supplement is, okay, so raising interest rates does cool off um, the amount of money out there by making loans more expensive to some extent. However, there's also $9 trillion in quantitative easing that has occurred in the last 15 years. And the last time they even tried to get rid of half a trillion of it, you know, a small percentage, it caused the stock market to crash in 2019. And so they had to like reverse course. And then they did, rather than continuing the quantitative tightening to rein in the easing uh, or to basically dispose of the easing that they had put out there, they had to do a fourth round of easing, taking it from six trillion to nine trillion. So that's where we're at now. It's unprecedented. And there's a real question of, can they actually do quantitative tightening and not have 2008 just pop back with a vengeance? And my thesis is, I think they probably can't, which means if that's how they saved the system, all they did was buy time. And unless they got some other fancy new trick, like that's it. You know, because that that's otherwise we'd still be living in that sort of post 2008, um, you know, credit crunch where nobody can take out a loan because no one has credit. You know, none of the businesses are credible and they can't get loans and just economic activity grinds to a halt at that point. That's really, really bad. So um, anyway, continuing, Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester recently said that she did not expect the labor market to be so strong 
in the face of much higher interest rates, but acknowledge that much of this has to do with unusual circumstances that resulted from the pandemic. For example, stimulus checks led to unprecedented spending that doesn't typically occur when the economy is in a recession. So in other words, as the pandemic, as we get further away, I mean, obviously, as we're just looking at the pandemic is still ongoing and that the virus is still spreading. It's still causing organ damage. It's still disabling people and it's still killing people. Um, and this is also having effects on whether people are able to work. And so that's affecting the labor market as well. But the public health interventions are over, you know, the uh, paying people to stay at home. That's over. And as we get further out from that, then the economy sort of resumes more of its normal behavior. And as it does that, it'll probably just take on its usual characteristics. So anyway, uh, in response to the increased demand, employers had to hire a lot more workers because people were being given money and they were trying to spend some of it. And yeah, so employers had to hire a lot more workers, uh, in some cases beyond their pre-pandemic staffing levels. Uh, the other issue there is that uh, wages also went up because people didn't want to go work and risk their health during a pandemic, although CNN probably less likely to talk about that or at least to highlight it. Quote, so we shouldn't be that surprised that perhaps some of these typical relationships are not necessarily being born at this time, Nestor said in a CNBC interview at Jackson Hole last month. So this is kind of what I was saying in the offline supplement as well to 105, which is that um, the pandemic probably served, and I don't mean served like in a, you know, they did it on purpose way, but it probably did serve to obscure um, or, you know, growing economic issues were probably covered up for a little while by the passing cloud of the pandemic and the public health interventions and things like that. The government had to take emergency measures to respond to a public health emergency, a novel virus that causes significant damage and death. Okay, so they took emergency measures and intervened in the economy in ways that they really don't normally do. Well, now that that's passing, you can expect within a couple of years, the economy just go back to doing what it was doing. And where was it prior to this? You know, where was it in 2017, 18, 19? And that's when we were looking at the situation of they were trying to do quantitative tightening getting some of these things off of the Fed's um, balance sheet, and uh, it wasn't working. So, you know, trying to get prices back down to sort of pre-2008 levels, where, you know, things were fairly stable for a, a long period of time before that, it sort of seems like they can't. Then the pandemic came along, bought some more time in that there's all these government emergency interventions, another round of quantitative easing. But now, OK, that's over. I mean, according to them, the emergency has passed. They're not going to take any more emergency measures. The virus hasn't passed, but their willingness to take emergency measures has passed. OK, so now as that dust clears, what's going to be coming out of this economy? And it's probably going to be a ginormous crash. So anyway, like Powell, Mester is not banking on immaculate disinflation. In other words, deflation without consequences, saying that it's not yet clear how the full effects of the Fed's cumulative rate hikes will play out. Mester is currently serving as an alternate member through the end of the year. She'll be voting on interest rate decisions at meetings next year. So if you see this going around, this is just pure wishful thinking based off of way insufficient data points. Um, you know, it'd be like the uh, sun goes behind a cloud for like five minutes and you're like, winter's coming early. No, 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 no. <laughs> like, wait three more minutes, the cloud will pass and like it's going to get bright, sunny and warmer again. So, um, yeah, definitely push back on this immaculate disinflation. It's just another way of saying, hey, we can just have capitalism without consequences. It doesn't work that way. It's never worked that way. And again, I think on a more macro time scale, we're just living on borrowed time since 2008. I think that bill is going to come due in the next one to two years. Um, we're already seeing signs of it right now. I think 24, 25 are going to be very painful years. But again, check out that uh, video for for more on that. All right, so where are we going next after this? Uh, Rico, let's get into the Rico thing. And we're not talking suave. So um, over 60 people, this is from Unicorn Riot, over 60 people indicted on RICO charges in Atlanta, 
allegedly promoting, quote, anarchist ideas. This is by Ryan Fatica from September 5, so very recent article. And uh, let's get to the second page here. So out of Atlanta, Georgia, Georgia prosecutors have indicted 61 individuals under the Georgia Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act, or RICO, for their alleged participation in the Stop Cop City movement, and for, as they put it, as they put it promoting, quote, virulent anarchist ideas. Okay, so now we're, politis or we're criminalizing political speech. So quoting this, I'm not sure why exactly it moves into the indent here, but the indictments were handed down by a grand jury last week. Oh, I guess it's not a quote. That was just sort of a, a big opening paragraph. All right. The indictments were handed down by a grand jury last week, but were only made public this morning after being discovered by the Atlanta Community Press Collective. The same grand jury also indicted five individuals on domestic terrorism charges and indicted three Atlanta Solidarity Fund activists on 15 counts each of money laundering. Quote, Defend the Atlanta Forest is a self-identified coalition and enterprise of militant anarchists, eco-activists, God forbid you stand up for the environment, and community organizers. Oh my God. You know, get them. They're trying to organize a community, the indictment reads. Based in Atlanta, this is continuing the quote, this anarchist, anti-police, and environmental activism organization coordinates, advertises, and conducts direct action designed to prevent the construction of the Atlanta Police Public Safety Training Center and Shadowbox Studios, previously known as Black Hall Studios, and promote anarchist ideas, unquote. Georgia Attorney General Chris Carr's office is prosecuting the cases, which are filed in Fulton County, where Atlanta is the county seat. The indictment even includes a short history on anarchism and anarchist organizing principles, at least as the prosecutors understand them. So they're really going after a political movement as a political movement. I wonder how this is going to hold up legally, because remember, this is an indictment. And as the saying goes, you can indict a ham sandwich. It's relatively easy to indict, much, much harder to you know convict. Um, the narrative entitled Anarchy Background of the Defend the Atlanta Forest reads like a high school book report on the history of anarchism and is reminiscent of political prosecutions of activists and radicals such as the Haymarket anarchists, Sacco and Vanzetti, and prosecutions during the Red Scare. If you're not familiar with the Haymarket anarchists or Sacco and Vanzetti, uh, or the Red Scare for that matter, we had two Red Scares in the U.S. The first Red Scare, which if somebody just says the Red Scare, they're talking about around World War I. I mean, they would just put people round them up on boats and like ship them back to Europe. That's like how how it was going in those days. Uh, you know, look up things like the Palmer Raids. So definitely a few things to look up if you haven't heard of those before. Uh, the major factor in anarchist mutual aid, explained Georgia prosecutors, quote, is the absence of government and the absence of hierarchy. Indeed, an anarchist belief relies on the notion that once government is abolished, individuals will rely on mutual aid to exist. In doing so, anarchists believe that individuals will work together and, voluntary, and voluntarily contribute their own resources to ensure that each individual has its own needs met, unquote. Um, so yeah, they're going after anarchism per se, and they're not doing so you know, on the basis that it's idealist. They're doing so that it challenges capitalism, however you know, ineffectively we might think as Marxists that, that it does so. Uh, they're going after the idea that, hey, these are people trying to organize a community and take care of themselves. Wow. Uh, prosecutors also explained at length that, quote, the anarchist ideology also includes violence, including violence targeting law enforcement. The indictment did not include any statistics about the number of people believed to have been harmed or killed by anarchists, which would be uh, probably zero. The number of people killed each year by law enforcement, on the other hand, is well known. Yes. So here's an excerpt, C, Anarchy Background of Defend the Atlanta Forest. Uh, anarchy is a philosophy that is opposed to forms of authority or hierarchy. Beginnings of anarchist ideals date back centuries. It really is like they did this sort of uh, Wikipedia article on anarchism here, and they're putting it in an indictment. So the indictment goes on to allege that those involved in the movement to defend the Willoughby Forest have participated in, quote, vandalizing of private property, arson, destruction of government property, attacks on utility workers, attacks on law enforcement, attacks on private citizens, and gun violence, unquote. 
So um, we did an episode of this on the Thin Blue Lies podcast. Look that up on Stop Cop City. And um, the cops just completely lied. They murdered one of the activists and said he was, you know, threatening them or whatever. The reality is that multiple cops, like, shot at him. He was unarmed. Uh, I think one of the cops shot one of the other cops in the process. Um, They're the ones that bring the violence. The cops bring the violence. There were people sitting in trees and, and protesting and... You know, that's what they're doing. And that's too much for this fascist police state. You know, and it's not a fascist police state yet, as we're discussing in yesterday's stream, where everyone walking around has, you know, no civil rights. They let most people um, who aren't, well, I say most people, what's a better way to qualify this? Uh, If you are not white, your odds of being targeted by police automatically go way up, especially if you're black, go up even further. Um, if you're sort of the average, you know, middle class aspiring white person going with the flow and whatever, yeah, you can go to the mall, you can like do all the things that are allowed by consumer society really without much of a problem most of the time. Um, and so you may not believe in the reality of a fascist police state because it's letting you do the things that you have whittled down your expectations in life to go along with. And you're not bumping up against any of the things that the system is trying to prevent you from doing. However, the more you do literally anything that in in the slightest way um, challenges the system, which includes at this point basically just living while black, uh, which this white supremacist system is, you know, just increasingly so threatened by because they know more and more black Americans are just becoming aware of the situation that they're in. And that makes the system nervous, et cetera. Um, anyway, the, the more likely you are to do something that matters, that, that is political protest or whatever, that's when you find out. And this is like the saying about, you know, um, you can find out the limits of free speech by like, well, I'm going to butcher it. But, you know, to the effect of like, uh, can you actually exercise this freedom uh, when it matters, you know, again, about things that are actually controversial. But anyway, continuing, prosecutors list... May 25, 2020, the day that George Floyd was murdered by Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin as the beginning of the alleged Defend the Atlanta Forest Enterprise. What an interesting um, date to pick. Prosecutors say that the national movement that emerged following Floyd's murder also gave birth to the Stop Cop City movement. Those indicted include many... This is really astounding, like how blatant they're being about... Uh, they're coming after us politically, you know. They're coming after people who are on the left in general, I think. They're obviously going after anarchists specifically. This would not really require much tweaking to go after anybody else in the broad left. Because how many people participated in the BLM protests, you know, following George Floyd's murder? There was so much kindling, dry kindling out there you know, George Floyd's murder was just the spark that set it off. But there was mountains of grievances all over this country. And yeah, they, you know, they'll come after everybody and just be like, you're a violent anarchist. Anyway, uh, those indicted include many people previously charged for their participation in the movement, including those previously charged with domestic terrorism, because yeah, they're thrown around domestic terrorism charges on people protesting this thing. That's how they separate the hardcore activists who are actually, you know, willing to put their bodies on the line and and go out and do this thing from normal people who, you know, there were polls, people in Atlanta, working class people, which is the majority of people anywhere, but including in Atlanta, uh, you know, don't support the cop city thing, but they can scare uh, normal people, (laughs) normal people, people aren't radicalized, you know, people haven't sort of like made the choice of I'm devoting significant portions of my time to like radical working class politics, but who, you know, oppose something like a cop city because they know that's not, you know, good for them and and so on. Um, they scare off the normies by, you know, throwing terrorism charges at, at people who do stand up. And so it's like, you know, it's like, hey, go back to the mall, go back to watching TV. We won't come after you if you do that. But, uh, you know, you start mixing up with these violent anarchists, you know, Oppo- you start opposing the police state, you know, there's going to be consequences. And, and the message gets received, you know. Three individuals previously charged with distributing flyers in Bartow County, Georgia. Several people arrested during a rowdy protest outside the Cobb County offices of contractor Brassfield and Gorey. 
and those charged with money laundering for their work with the Atlanta Solidarity Fund, among others. The list of indictments also includes several people who are not previously, who have not previously been charged in connection with the movement. So it's people who have been charged with other things previously, as well as new people. And they're really coming out. I mean, this is knives out fully. Quote, the state is setting themselves up for a bigger fall when they fail. Activist Charlie Tenenbaum, who is one of those indicted on RICO charges, told Unicorn Riot, which I still believe is the ultimate outcome of the state's legal fight. I mean, this is preposterous. It's also frightening if this gains any traction because it will be, it's a scary precedent if it succeeds. The odds are it will fail because, you, <laughs> again, this is, you know, prosecution basically for political beliefs. Um, and also just massive distortions of what people are actually doing by protesting Cop City. So, uh, yeah, there's a decent chance it will fail. It's still scary to see something like this launched on the off chance that any of it does stick. Charlie said that although the new indictments are stressful, they ultimately do feel prepared for the legal battle to come. Quote, I can speak for myself personally that I feel prepared for this. Before the RICO indictment, Charlie was arrested in April on a felony charge for distributing flyers associated with the Stop Cop City movement. The indictments list 225, quote, overt acts in furtherance of the racketeering conspiracy. So the protest movement is now a racketeering conspiracy, according to these fascist prosecutors, which includes actions ranging from throwing Molotov cocktails and punching police officers to requesting reimbursements for $14.08, cents for a lock for a trailer from the Forest Justice Defense Fund. That's, that's an offense. That's, that's an overt act in furtherance of the racketeering conspiracy. Under RICO, it is not a requirement that such, quote, overt acts be illegal on their own. The indictment also alleges, for, this is like, it's reminding me of, um, so basically anything that you do that helps something that is a conspiracy here, which is just a criminal uh, or, you know, outside of a legal context, immoral thing, you know, shady thing engaged in by a group. That's what conspiracy means. So here it's a conspiracy to like break some laws or whatever the fuck the state is saying. Uh, and anything you do in furtherance of that, even trying to get, you know, $14 for, for a lock for a trailer, um, that gets lumped in. Sort of reminds me of when they do civil asset forfeitures, which is when the cops rob you um, and they just, you know, find stuff in your car. They find property in your car, money or stuff. And they take it saying that, oh, we suspect that this property was involved in a crime. Like, what? No, that's, that's not how that works. But that's how they're doing it now, <clears throat> and they're getting away with it for now. The indictment also alleges for the first time that Marlon Kautz, Adele McLean, and Savannah Patterson, the three activists arrested in May for their work on the Atlanta Solidarity Fund, are responsible for posting content to the Scenes from the Atlanta Forest blog. The blog is a submission-based platform that frequently posts communiques claiming responsibility for attacks and vandalism on the property of those seeking to destroy the Willani Forest. The indictment alleges that posting submitted articles is part of a conspiracy, but includes no evidence that the three activists are responsible for running the site. The indictment includes one act that simply involved writing some letters on a piece of paper. Quote, on or about January 18, 2023, the indictment reads, an activist, quote, did sign his name as ACAB. This was an overt act in furtherance of the conspiracy, unquote. And there it is right there, Jeffrey Parsons. He wrote ACAB, let's call him a terrorist. Atlanta, and this is what we were saying, by the way, back in the Bush-Cheney years that no one wants to talk about, uh, that people just act like the years, you know, 2001 to 2009 basically didn't happen. Uh, they did. And this is when they were doing the Patriot Act and all the, you know, there's a terrorist behind every corner stuff. This is ultimately what it was intended for always. It was a massive ramping up of militarization under the guise of the bullshit war on terror. And uh, that included, you know, that's abroad uh, starting a meta war that would let the U.S. and its allies invade any country that they wanted to on suspicion of terrorism and also domestically to... Uh, continue rapidly ramping up the transformation uh, begun earlier in the 80s and 90s, especially of the domestic police and surveillance state as well. So this is what it was all about. It's not really about this sort of, uh, 
you know, Al Qaeda, El Qaeda, whatever. It's about this. That's what it's about. It's about capitalism going into its terminal stage and turning fascist because it's under crisis. Fascism is essentially the open terroristic rule of capital when it's in a crisis. And that's exactly what they knew they were going into entering the 21st century and they're turning the screws. Here we are. We're living through it. Atlanta activists warned the public in February that they believe state prosecutors were planning on indicting them under the state's RICO laws based upon leaked information. Nearly 17 months later, their predictions have come true. The Stop Cop City Vote Coalition criticized the charges on the platform X, formerly known as Twitter, saying, quote, these charges, like the previous repressive prosecutions by the state of Georgia, seek to intimidate prosecutors, oh, sorry, seek to intimidate protesters, legal observers, and bail funds alike, and send the chilling message that any dissent to Cop City will be punished with the full power and violence of the government, unquote. This is exactly when they were rolling out the War on Terror and the Patriot Act, uh, you know, 20 years ago. It was the exact same thing, to have a chilling effect. And basically, if you stand up at all, you will be crushed. We're authorizing every kind of force known to humanity to be used. And so this is, this is that, and that was the purpose of it. They don't do it just for fun. They do it because their system needs it. Although some of them enjoy it, but anyway. Uh, and of course, you know, they find the people who enjoy it most to actually go out and be the enforcers. The indictments come in the midst of a court battle over a proposed referendum vote on the Stop Cop City project. The proposed referendum would allow residents of Atlanta to vote on whether the proposed Atlanta Public Safety Training Center should be built. The city of Atlanta has repeatedly filed motions in court attempting to suppress the effort to collect enough signatures to get the referendum on the ballot, including continually attempting to raise the bar for the number of signatures that activists must gather. Quote, it seems like the timing is politically motivated with respect to the referendum and the successes we're winning there, despite the state's ongoing demonstrations of exactly why we do not want to fund a cop city, said Charlie Tenenbaum. Their tactics of using fear and oppression times with our successes. Yeah, it's a transparent intimidation effort. In June, DeKalb County District Attorney, uh, DeKalb County District Attorney Sherry Boston announced that she would formally withdraw from Georgia State cases connected to the protest at the proposed police training center site, citing differences in prosecutorial philosophy. There you go. Georgia Attorney, Gen uh, Georgia Attorney General Chris Carr has defended the charges brought against activists and insists that those cases will continue to be pursued at the state level. Then again, you know, the Republican Party was passing laws to make it uh, legal to run over protesters with your car. So that's sort of the stage of things that we're at. The recent RICO indictments are signed by Carr and Deputy Attorney General John Fowler. The Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act, or RICO, targets organized criminal enterprises and was created in the 1970s to more effectively prosecute the mafia, an actually criminal organization. Since then, RICO statutes have been used against participants in the 2019 college admissions scandal. I think that was the thing with Lori Laughlin, um, Aunt Becky, remember that one? Anti-abortion groups, insider traders, and now environmental and climate justice activists. Rather than charging individuals with specific crimes they committed, RICO indictments target alleged criminal organizations in which people collaborate to commit a series of interrelated crimes in furtherance of a common criminal goal. For charges to stick, prosecutors must prove that those charged engaged in a, quote, pattern of racketeering activity involving at least two acts in furtherance of one or more incidents, schemes, or transactions. Georgia recently leveraged its RICO statute to charge rappers Young Thug, Gunna, and dozens of others for their alleged participation in a street gang known as Young Slime Life or YSL. In that case, the Fulton County District Attorney alleged in their indictment that participants in the group engaged in a slew of criminal activities in furtherance of a common enterprise, including murder and multiple charges of aggravated assault and armed robbery. If found guilty, those charged under Georgia's RICO law face, quote, not less than five nor more than 20 years imprisonment, in addition to fines totaling the greater of $25,000 or three times the amount of any pecuniary value gained by him or her from such violation. So, I mean, those are pretty serious sentences. Uh, the same, uh, very serious sentences. The same grand jury that handed down the RICO indictments 
also issued indictments of five individuals on domestic terrorism charges, although a total of 42 individuals have previously been charged under Georgia's domestic terrorism statute for their alleged participation in the movement to defend the Wolani Forest. Until now, none of those charged have been indicted. The five indicted under the domestic terrorism statute were all charged in Fulton County following a January 2021 2023 demonstration called by, oh, did I say 2021? Let's try that again. The five indicted under the domestic terrorism statute were all charged in Fulton County following a January 21, 2023 demonstration called by forest defenders in response to the police killing of Manuel Esteban Paez Turan, a, uh, a 26-year-old forest defender who went by the name Tortuguita. During the demonstration, a police car was set afire, and prosecutors allege that protesters attempted to break into a building at 191 Peachtree Street Tower, which contains the offices of the Atlanta Police Foundation. There's a video there if you want to look it up. The five indicted on domestic terrorism charges are also indicted on one charge each of arson in the first degree. The indictment alleges that the five, quote, did travel to the city of Atlanta during a, quote, night of rage, did possess means of fire and explosive by possessing accelerant and a lighter, and did attempt to break into the 191 Peachtree Street Tower, contrary to the laws of the state, the good order, peace, and dignity thereof. Last screen. The RICO indictments come shortly after Atlanta activists released a parody called The People's RICO, in which the people of Atlanta allege that the city, the Atlanta Police Foundation, and its funders are involved in a racketeering effort to build Cop City. Quote, After an extensive investigation, they declared, we've determined that there is an active criminal enterprise with clear intentions to extort and conspire to destroy our treasured South River Forest, unquote. Despite its novel and legally questionable claims, the new RICO indictment seems guaranteed to instill fear in activist circles in Georgia and beyond. According to defendant Charlie Tenenbaum, this is exactly why it's necessary for those fighting Cop City to be confident and to keep taking care of each other. Quote, It's important for us to remember that supporters and people can continue to hold in solidarity, to express love and support, donate to fundraisers, do care work, said Charlie. We're winning and that scares them. Now you can read the 109 page indictment at Unicorn Riot. All right, so that's our Rico story. Now we're gonna move on to the Russia stuff. Get this ready to go. For some reason, my, uh, I try to set the streaming program so it opens out of the right folder. Oh, I actually got it that time. Neat. All right. What order am I doing the Russia stuff in here? We're starting with Russia deficit. Okay. All right. So about a year and a half ago, the country of Russia invaded Ukraine. We um, didn't support this at the time. This actually caused kind of a split among people watching the channel, uh, people who knew what the fuck they were doing, <laughs> those of us not supporting it, and those of us who are willing to throw in uh, with the Russian bourgeoisie who are sitting atop what once was the most advanced socialist project in the world in history and uh, are, you know, preventing its return uh, in collaboration with capitalists all over the world. They're throwing in with them and uh, like the completely bankrupt Communist Party of the Russian Federation, co-founded by Alexander Dugin, an imperial theorist and Russian fascist neo-Nazi at the time, um, and uh, continues to be one today. Um, you got the people who threw in with them and were willing to tail Putin and the Russian bourgeoisie, and you had people who recognized what was going on between Russia and NATO as an inter-imperialist conflict. Obviously, Russia is not as well established as an advanced capitalist or imperialist power as uh, you know, the NATO countries, the United States, and so on. But uh, that's actually part of the problem. They are the new kid on the block. They're trying to get a bigger cut out of you know, the global profits pie. And it wasn't really going in their favor. NATO was rebuffing them in various ways. I mean, they were doing business with them, 
But it was clear Russia was going to be a junior member pretty much forever. And uh, they didn't like that. So um, after you know, a variety of intrigues over the years, uh, we get to the invasion of Ukraine, which is continuing. You know, they said it would be over, sort of like the U.S. invasion of Iraq. Uh, you know, it's supposed to be over in a week. Uh, we'd be welcomed with uh, flowers, etc. And to be fair, there is some support um, in certain regions of Ukraine for the Russian invasion. That said, what they're doing, there's no legal support for it whatsoever under by any standard. Um, and they are continuing to wage war across Ukraine, um, devastating infrastructure, uh, it, it just complete atrocities. So where this has landed them, you know, far from being this sort of cakewalk that would be over as soon as it started, it's been dragging on for a year and a half. Now Russia has reported a uh, massive budget deficit that um, is the biggest sort of in the post-Soviet era or the second biggest. Uh, their economy is in trouble. Their currency is also struggling. And this was after the invasion, um, looking at the uh, the... Russian ruble versus the um, U.S. dollar for a minute here, we can see, this is the 10-year chart, that going back to like 2013, uh, much better exchange rate, immediately following the invasion, the ruble fell to basically nothing as it was completely unclear what was going to happen. Russia was being threatened with all kinds of sanctions, etc. And then it briefly rebounded. And so last summer, it appeared to be riding high. It was doing better than it had in almost a decade. And a lot of the uh, Putin simps were, you know, uh, Russia's back baby, whatever. Well, not so much at the moment. Since December, when more of the European sanctions came in, because Europe was uh, really relying on Russian uh, petroleum products in order to stay warm through the cold European winter. Uh, but after sort of the purchases were made, they then, in December and January, turned on the sanctions in full force. And since that time, basically all throughout 2023, the value of the ruble has been dropping. So that's against the US dollar. And then we'll see it actually in the reverse. So it'll be uh, here going down is bad. But on this chart, here is rubles to euro. And uh, here, uh, so basically up is bad on this chart because this is um, how many rubles are equal to one euro. And so we went uh, in just one year. So this is basically, you know, over the past year or so, it's been a steady devaluation. And uh, it recently crossed the 100 mark after previously being down around 60. So that's a sig significant loss in purchasing power of the ruble versus the euro. As we saw, basically the same thing happened with the dollar. Also, here's against the Indian rupee, another major trade partner, and also the I in BRICS, so the BRICS capitalist bloc, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, now South Africa. Um, so India, another major trade partner, exact same pattern. And then comparing against the Chinese Yuan, uh, we have the exact same pattern. <laughs> so for the last year, um, steadily declining in value. So the ruble's not doing good. Um, the war is dragging on. We see other things, um, signs of economic turmoil in Russia. So going back to the deficit for a minute, where did this deficit come from? Well, it came from, in part, Russia doubling their war spending. So this is from just last month. It's from a month ago, August 4. They just doubled their, quote, defense spending. It's, it's really war spending. So they're spending lots more money on this sustained invasion. They're losing tons of equipment. And they're just, you know, wars are expensive. You got to use a lot of material to do it. And it's going to, you know, you're going to bleed money as time goes on. They are. So as the currency is being affected, uh, the Russian central bank raised interest rates to 12%. That's a really significant rise in the exchange rate because they're trying to control the inflation. The problem is it's not just as simple as inflation. There are a lot of fundamental problems. Uh, Russia exports a lot of oil and gas. They were trying to demand payments in rubles. The problem is that um, oil and gas generally is pegged to the dollar. So that really was never going to work. And so with a weaker currency with less purchasing power, that's going to hurt them on exports. 
and then it's also going to hurt them on imports as well. So people in Russia right now, I mean, the average person that's just sort of not making these decisions and caught in the crossfire and left holding the bag of all this, they're suffering. Uh, they're going through hard times economically as the Russian bourgeoisie just pisses away the National Wealth Fund and just the national wealth in general of Russia in the name of trying to reassert themselves as, you know, some uh, important capitalist imperialist power. And again, who suffers? So it's very unclear where all of this is going. But for my money, you know, I never supported this and I didn't... Uh, refused to support it on the basis that I didn't think they were going to win. I didn't support it on the basis that communists do not support inter-imperialist, well, in an inter-imperialist conflict, we don't support one of the imperialists. The position you take is revolutionary defeatism, wanting to see the defeat all around of the imperialists, including sort of your national bourgeoisie or the, the people on your side of it. Um, because what is the aim? The aim is social revolution. You don't, um, you want to see the defeat of, you know, the quote, your home bourgeois government, not its success. That doesn't mean that you want the other side to win either. It means you want just loss all around, which will weaken the governments and then pave the way for social revolution to get rid of this rotten system. Um, a lot of the rhetoric that was going around was support Russia, they're challenging U.S. imperialism. I think they're actually getting their ass kicked and murdering a lot of innocent people in the process. It doesn't even work according to that logic, which is not revolutionary defeatist. But there's various revisionist groups out there. We talked about like Brian Becker at the Answer Coalition pushing the line that this is not an inter-imperialist conflict, that Russia is not imperialist. Okay, what's the name of the book by Lenin? Imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. The USSR was actually beyond capitalism. It was socialist. It then reverted to capitalism. And yes, is not at an early stage of capitalism. It is at an advanced stage of capitalism, which has all the hallmarks of imperialism as described by Lenin, the monopolization and export of capital. It's not to the same extent as the US, but that's not what we're doing here. We're not playing... Um, lesser evil imperialism. It's you don't support advanced capitalism, period. That's that's the whole thing. People, I, I don't know how many times I heard, well, what about the Kuomintang in China? China had not even really developed capitalism yet. There was a bourgeoisie, you know, we're talking about the 1930s and 40s defending against Imperial Japan invading. Um, at best, you know, the, the alliance with the Kuomintang, the Chinese nationalists, uh, capitalists, basically, um, was tenuous and fraught and there were betrayals. But even then, that bourgeoisie was not developed. It was ascending um, and China was not imperialist at that time. They had just emerged out of feudalism and it's just, it's not remotely the same conditions. You know, there there is some actual um, possibility of a national liberation type struggle um, with the fledgling national bourgeoisie against a clear imperialist invasion. Uh, Russia also not invaded there, but i um, not even going to get into that part right now. But yeah, China in the 1930s and 40s, um, you know, not advanced capitalism, not imperialism, completely different situation, completely fundamentally dishonest, disingenuous to try to even make that comparison to Russia in the 2020s. It's a, totally absurd. Uh, nonetheless, that hasn't stopped people from trying to portray Russia as not only not imperialist, but anti-imperialist. They're about as anti-imperialist as Hitler's Germany was. You know, um, rival imperialism is not anti-imperialism. You don't just fight imperialism with other imperialism. And check out the community tab at the Socialism for All YouTube channel. I'll be sharing a stream about um, some anti-revisionist communists in Russia and Ukraine uh, sharing their thoughts on the war. Uh, they oppose it, <laughs> not surprisingly. So anyway, here we are a year and a half into this uh, blunder of the Russian national bourgeoisie. Also the Wagner private military company, mercenaries basically, their leader was just assassinated in a plane crash, at least an apparent assassination. Uh, Russia hasn't officially stated that yes, it was an assassination. That seems to be how things work there. 
the Wagner group was major reserves for this invasion. So, and then Putin was having, um, the, the Russian government, I should say, was having the, the Wagner soldiers, you know, swear new oaths of allegiance to the Russian government and this and that. Those were major reserves for this war, was this private mercenary group. And I don't know, are they still going to be able to do this? So th these are the results to date. Uh, things do not seem to be going well. And, you know, again, I wouldn't have supported this even if they were victorious, because it's going to lead to more problems down the line. The issue is, as communists, we don't support one imperialist over another, even small ones, even ones that seem to be going against the grain. You just don't do that. We're interested in social revolution, revolutionary defeatism. There's also the issue of Russia exiting the grain deal. So Russia and Ukraine both are major grain exporters, meaning they feed a lot of the world. Um, you know, sunflower seeds, barley, wheat, things like that. Uh, sunflower seeds, not a grain specifically, but these sort of baseline staples. They're major exporters of grain. And the war has greatly disrupted this. Uh, Russia now has backed out of a grain deal, citing it wants some of its demands met, Otherwise, it's not going to uh, let the world you know, get this grain coming out of there. So anything you want to criticize the U.S. for, and there's plenty, um, I think it's pretty clear Russia's, you know, aspiring to sort of uh, exhibit the same type of behavior that has been correctly criticized for so long um, by the U.S. and its allies, you know, holding the world hostage and so on. So now we've got a food shortage coming. And Russia just uh, attacked and boarded a Turkish ship that was going for a grain port. So anyway, for the multipolarity people out there, I want to remind you this whole um, idea, whether you're following Ben Norton or whatever it is, um, the multipolarity thing is a liberal theory. It's, it's an uh, idealist, utopian theory that capitalism can just, as long as you have like a balance of power within the capitalist world, capitalism can sort of peacefully exist and you're not going to have world wars and all the other things that we know capitalism is going to do. We know, at least as Marxists, that capitalism is going to do. Um, it's a liberal anti-Marxist theory to believe that, you know, multipolar, multipolar world peace among capitalists can be a thing. So let's turn our attention here. And these are the last two articles we're going to do before we get back to the chat and close out the stream um, about BRICS. So BRICS is the sort of emerging alternative capitalist group uh, that is conducting a lot of trade amongst themselves. The term BRICS, again, coined by a Goldman Sachs analyst about 20 years ago to describe emerging markets where Western capitalists could uh, park their money and maybe try to exploit them and, uh, you know, uh, get uh, return on investment out of these emerging markets. So it was conceived as uh, you know, just another capitalist scheme, basically. So BRICS had a summit uh, recently, just a couple of weeks ago, and as this article from uh, Business Insider, Markets Insider, says the BRICS summit ended with no new currency and all five members issuing differing and contradictory commentary about de-dollarization. So there's like a lot of um, speculation and wishful thinking among the multipolarity bros that BRICS is going to make their own currency, and they could, but there's currently not really any concrete plans of that, so it continues to be fantasy and wishful thinking. So um, that if BRICS makes its own currency, it can swing the world away from the dollar and towards this other group of capitalists instead, and this will sort of like pave the way to world peace, and yeah, um, that's not really how this works. Uh, the U.S. is a vile power as far as the many sanctions that they spearhead it is in some ways uniquely awful um but centering it so much rather than class struggle per se uh this is a major mistake uh the internal conditions within a country are always the primary contradiction that you look at u.s sanctions and things like that for if you're not in the u.s you know this falls under external contradictions and um it's just never the primary thing so these people are like basically walking away from social revolution and sort of the basic theories of Marxism and organizing and how you get that kind of change away from capitalism. And instead they're embracing these um, pro-capitalist revisionist, totally revisionist theories about how we're gonna get this change. Anyway, 
So, but is de-dollarization even going to happen? It's not really close on the horizon. So when you hear people saying this, remind them, this is pure speculation. You know, I mean, it's just, <laughs> what else to say? There's no, there's no evidence for it. So let's read the article. Uh, de-dollarization was a closely watched topic amid the BRICS summit last week. But BRICS nations appeared divided on the issue, as statements from the bloc's leaders indicated. The, the latest SWIFT data showed that the USD was used for a record 46% of foreign exchange payments in July. And uh, so, you know, continues to be sort of the, the major currency for now. A group of major emerging economies wrapped up a summit in South Africa last Thursday by welcoming six new members, but without a new dollar challenging currency. The summit of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, or BRICS nations, added Saudi Arabia, Iran, Ethiopia, Egypt, Argentina, and the United Arab Emirates to its fold. It is the bloc's first expansion in 13 years, as it seeks to be an alternative to Western-led groupings. Again, you know, such socialist powerhouses as the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia. While there was talk about the bloc's possible creation of a common currency to rival the U.S. dollar, that didn't happen. In fact, chatter from the BRICS nations on the issue was divided, pointing to different opinions that may delay any such development. As this dollar alternative was being discussed, data from SWIFT showed that the greenback was used for a record 46% of foreign exchange payments via the communication system in July. Here's what the leaders of five BRICS members said about de-dollarization. Brazil's president called for a common BRICS currency. So Lula is saying, quote, the creation of a currency for trade and investment transactions between BRICS members increases our payment options and reduces our vulnerabilities. Brazil's president, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, said at the summit's opening plenary session on Wednesday, the Brazilian leader has been one of the most vocal proponents of alternative trade settlement currencies. And this is something of a pattern with Lula where you know, Lula was going to broker a peace deal between Ukraine and Russia. Hasn't happened. So it's like known for sort of uh, advancing ideas that don't necessarily come to fruition. Just doesn't seem to have that power. Quote, why can't we do trade based on our own currencies? He said in an April state visit to China, per the Financial Times. Who was it that decided that the dollar was the currency after the disappearance of the gold standard? So turning to Russia, I guess we're just going the neat. We're going in order. BR. Now we're on R. Putin renewed his call to increase the use of local currencies for trade. Quote, we are working to fine-tune effective mechanisms for mutual settlements and monetary and financial control, said Russian President Vladimir Putin on Tuesday. He added that de-dollarization within the BRIC blocks is irreversible and gaining pace. Putin has been pushing for more trade in local currencies following sweeping sanctions against Russia that have expelled the country from the U.S. dollar-dominated global financial system. He said at a previous international meeting in July that it was important to establish a, quote, independent financial system based on local currency trade. Now, let's ask here for a minute, does, you know, the U.S. and its close allies, other longstanding imperialist countries, do they have too much power that they can just, you know, kick people out of the global financial system? Yeah, absolutely. We don't want to see that continue. The question is, what's the alternative? just sort of, uh, you know, uh, other blocks of capitalists competing with them. Historically, that just leads to world wars. So, no, that in and of itself is not really any, you know, that's not a solution. Uh, the solution is social revolution. But as revisionists back away from social revolution, you know, that's not something that uh, gets discussed so much. But that is what we, in fact, need to push. So every time these alternative anti-Marxist theories get raised, we need to push back on them. India's oil minister said that it's difficult to overturn long-standing payment arrangements. Quote, I wish the Indian rupee should be the lead currency in the world. I mean, yeah, it's like, don't we all wish we're like the center of everything? But I'm also a realist. Hardeep Singh Puri, India's oil and gas minister, told CNBC on the sidelines of the Business 20 meeting in New Delhi on Friday. Long-standing payment arrangements are difficult to overturn, even if there are arrangements for trade in non-dollar currencies, he added. Quote, but does that mean that an alternate global currency has come? Puri asked CNBC. We heard about decoupling, but these international arrangements, trading arrangements, payment arrangements, these have been in place for a long time. India has also been pushing the de-dollarization narrative by touting the use of the rupee for trade. Like, what are the odds of that? Good luck with that. Um, 
I want to go just back for a second. Did I finish the Putin thing? Uh, I think I missed maybe the end. Putin said at a previous international meeting in July that it was important to establish a, quote, independent financial system based on local currency trade. So it sounds like Putin doesn't want a specific new currency, but just wants to, like, use the home country's currencies more. All right, and that was India. So now let's go on to China. China's President Xi promoted reform of the world's financial systems. It's an interesting way to put it when you're pushing for world communism, ostensibly. China did not comment on the idea of a BRICS common currency, but President Xi Jinping promoted, quote, the reform of the international financial and monetary system in a speech at the summit. I might look up that speech. China has indicated that it wants the Chinese yuan to play an outsized global role, but hasn't called for it to replace the dollar. And this is China's position on a lot of things. They're currently the second largest economy. And, you know, depending on how things go, they could actually become a larger economy than the U.S., which is currently um, the largest. But they say in regard to that, you know, we don't want to rule the world and all this kind of stuff. So this is kind of in line with that. Um, and, you know, so China also not uh, commenting on the idea of a currency more. We would like it to be the yuan, somewhat in line with um, India. We'd like it to be the rupee. Russia says, you know, let just let the countries keep their currencies, but we'll just deal in them more. And Brazil wants a new currency. South Africa's finance minister dismissed the notion of a BRICS currency. Quote, no one has tabled the issue of a BRICS currency, not even in informal meetings. Enoch Gonongwana told Bloomberg on the sidelines of the bloc's annual summit in Johannesburg on Thursday. Quote, setting up a common currency presupposes setting up a central bank. And that presupposes losing independence on monetary policies. And I don't think any country is ready for that, he added to the media outlet. Instead, South Africa appears to veer toward increasing the bloc's trade in local currencies, so more the um, Russian position. Back in April, South Africa's Deputy President Paul Mashatil had said that the BRICS bloc was looking to reduce its reliance on the U.S. dollar. And finally, the economist who coined the term BRICS slammed the idea altogether. Jim O'Neill, a former Goldman Sachs economist who first gave the BRICS bloc its name, has slapped down the idea of a common BRICS currency. Quote, it's just ridiculous, he told the Financial Times in an August interview. They're going to create a BRICS central bank? How would you do that? It's embarrassing almost. O'Neill pointed to the political gulf between rivals China and India as a key stumbling block to de-dollarization, which is what we saw. China wants to use their currency. India wants to use their currency. And um, they're, I mean, they tend to be rivals in a, in a lot of ways. So continuing, quote, it's a good job for the West that China and India never agree on anything, because if they did, the dominance of the dollar would be a lot more vulnerable, O'Neill told the Financial Times. So uh, there you go. That's the first article. Here is the second BRICS article. It's shorter, but a lip, I think this is a more interesting article. Those were some of the basics, just the report from the conference. Here's one that's a bit more speculative and gets into some of the theories behind this, and then we'll go to the chat, and uh, that will be today's stream. So here's an article uh, from June. A BRICS currency is unlikely to dislodge the dollar anytime soon, but it signifies growing challenge to the established economic order. So could, and this was from the conversation, uh, could a new currency be set to challenge the dominance of the dollar? Perhaps, but that may not be the point. In August 2023, South Africa will host the leaders of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. That was the meeting we just read about a group of nations known by the acronym BRICS. Among the items on the agenda is the creation of a new joint BRICS currency, which, again, didn't even come close to uh, fruition. As a scholar that has studied the BRICS countries for over a decade, I can certainly see why talks of a BRIC currency is, well, gaining currency. The BRICS summit comes as countries across... Uh, the BRICS summit comes as countries across the world are confronting a changing geopolitical landscape that is challenging the traditional dominance of the West. And while the BRICS countries have been seeking to reduce their reliance on the dollar for over a decade, Western sanctions on Russia after its invasion of Ukraine have accelerated the process. Indeed, all of the Russia supporters on, for example, uh, X Twitter. Um, one thing I really appreciate about Blue Sky, virtually zero Russia supporters. Anyway, that's all the Russian propaganda is about for sure. Uh, meanwhile, rising interest rates and the recent debt ceiling crisis in the U.S. 
have raised concerns among other countries about their dollar-denominated debt and the demise of the dollar, should the world's leading economy ever default. Now, come back to what we were talking about before with I think 2008 is coming back. Uh, rather than some sort of you know utopian capitalist world peace, I think the result is going to be absolute fucking chaos and misery um, in the absence of socialism, which there certainly is an absence of. But you know, <laughs> more on that later. All that said, a new BRICS currency faces major hurdles before becoming a reality. But what currency discussions do is show that the BRICS countries are seeking to discover and develop new ideas about how to shake up international affairs and effectively coordinate policies around these ideas. De-dollarization momentum. With 88% of international transactions conducted in U.S. dollars. Remember, we were talking about SWIFT before, That's, but beyond that, 88% overall are conducted in the U.S. dollars. And the dollar accounting for 58% of global foreign exchange reserves. The dollar's global dominance is indisputable, yet de-dollarization, or reducing an economy's reliance on the U.S. dollar for international trade and finance, has been accelerating following the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The BRICS countries have been pursuing a wide range of initiatives to decrease their dependence on the dollar. Over the past year, Russia, China, and Brazil have turned to greater use of non-dollar currencies in their cross-border transactions. Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates are actively exploring dollar alternatives, and central banks have sought to shift more of their currency reserves away from the dollar and into gold. All the BRICS nations have been critical of the dollar's dominance for different reasons. Russian officials have been championing de-dollarization to ease the pain from sanctions. Because of sanctions, Russian banks have been unable to use SWIFT, the global messaging system that enables bank transactions. And the West froze Russia's $330 billion in reserves last year. Uh, a not insignificant amount. Picture uh, touting the BRICS summit. Meanwhile, the 2022 election in Brazil reinstated Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva as president. Lula is a longtime proponent of BRICS who previously sought to reduce Brazil's dependence on and vulnerability to the dollar. He has re-energized the group's commitment to de-dollarization and has spoken about creating a new euro-like currency. The Chinese government has also clearly laid out its concerns with the dollar's dominance, labeling it, quote, the main source of instability and uncertainty in the world economy. Not capitalism, you know, just the, just the dollar. Beijing directly blamed the Fed's interest rate hike for causing turmoil in the international financial market and substantial depreciation of other currencies. Wow. So they don't like the interest rate hikes. Um, get ready because they're holding steady uh, and, you know, as quantitative tightening deepens, uh, how are they going to feel then? Anyway, this is capitalism. The, you know, you want to go down this road? This is what lies down this road. Anyway, um, together with other BRICS countries, China has also criticized the use of sanctions as a geopolitical weapon. A BRICS version of the euro is unlikely for now. None of the countries involved show any desire to discontinue its local currency. Rather, the goal appears to be to create an efficient, integrated payment system for cross-border transactions as the first step, and then introduce a new currency. Building blocks for this already exist. In 2010, the BRICS interbank cooperation mechanism was launched to facilitate cross-border payments between BRICS banks and local currencies. BRICS nations have been developing BRICS Pay, a payment system for transactions among the BRICS without having to convert local currency into dollars. And there has been talk of a BRICS cryptocurrency and of strategically aligning the development of central bank digital currencies to promote currency interoperability and economic integration. Since many countries expressed an interest in joining BRICS, the group is likely to scale its de-dollarization agenda. So that's, that's what they got so far. And it's not insignificant, but it's a long way from fully complete. So, um, you know, is it five years off? Like, who knows? But um, I think we're likely to get that massive crash before it gets, like, fully established. So that's sort of a major issue there. Anyway, from BRICS vision to reality. To be sure, some of the group's most ambitious past initiatives to set up major BRICS projects to parallel non-Western infrastructures have failed. Big ideas like developing a BRICS credit rating agency and creating a BRICS undersea cable never materialized. And de-dollarization efforts have been struggling both at the multilateral and bilateral level. 
In 2014, when the BRICS countries launched the New Development Bank, its founding agreement outlined that its operations may provide financing in the local currency of the country in which the operation takes place. Yet, in 2023, nine years later, the bank remains heavily dependent on the dollar for its survival. Local currency financing represents around 22% of the bank's portfolio, although its new president hopes to increase that to 30% by 2026. Similar challenges exist in bilateral de-dollarization pursuits. Russia and India have sought to develop a mechanism for trading in local currencies, which would enable Indian importers to pay for Russia's cheap oil and coal in rupees. However, talks were suspended after Moscow cooled on the idea of rupee accumulation. Despite the barriers to de-dollarization, the BRICS group's determination to act should not be dismissed. The group has been known for defying expectations in the past. Despite many differences among the five countries, the bloc managed to develop joint policies and survive major crises such as the 2020-2021 China-India border clashes and the war in Ukraine. BRICS has deepened its cooperation, invested in new financial institutions, and has been continuously broadening the range of policy issues it addresses. It now has a huge network of interlinked mechanisms that connect governmental officials, businesses, academics, think tanks, and other stakeholders across countries. Even if there is no movement on the joint currency front, there are multiple issues on which BRICS finance ministers as well as central bankers regularly coordinate, and the potential for developing new financial collaborations is particularly strong. No doubt, talk of a new BRICS currency in itself is an important indicator of the desire of many nations to diversify away from the dollar. But I believe focusing on the BRICS currency risks missing the forest for the trees. A new global economic order will not emerge out of a new BRICS currency or de-dollarization happening overnight, but it can potentially emerge out of BRICS commitment to coordinating their policies and innovating, something this currency initiative represents. Okay, so a mixed bag here. The currency thing, not happening. Other things are happening more, but slowly. You know, uh, 22% after nine years is very slow progress. Meanwhile, capitalism is in a terminal stage, and, you know, how much longer before, like, will they be able to set any of this up before not just one, but maybe two, if there even is another one after another 2008-type crash? I don't know. You know, I mean, I'm not sure anybody knows that um, right now. But what I want to really focus on here is, again, the multipolarity bros that are posing as Marxists or Marxist-Leninists. This is a real degeneration of revisionism into something just not even resembling uh, any kind of, you know, as Luxembourg says in Reform or Revolution, everybody that comes in trying to dismantle Marxism presents themselves first as a Marxist, because that's the only way to get Marxists to listen to you. But at this point, uh, the stuff that is trying to pass itself off as Marxist is like so many steps removed. It's, you know, copy of a copy of a copy of a copy that at this point they're just crossing their fingers and hoping that the bourgeoisie of Russia and India and China and uh, Brazil and South Africa and the United Arab Emirates, etc., are going to uh, get away from the dollar. And then, you know, let's say that they set up a new capitalist block, which is more uh, whatever that the manages to hold its own for a while at least before world war three happens um against the u.s nato sort of older imperialist bloc i mean what do you think BRICS is going to do like why do you think that the u.s and the uk and france and so on the imf and the world bank why do you think they engage in the predatory and exploitative practices that they engage in why do you think they do that is it because they're bad people is it because they're white it's because of capitalism. So this is like how the system works. It's the fundamental logic of it. Any country engaging in capitalism, capitalism is fundamentally exploitation. You can't have capitalism without exploitation. This is pure utopianism otherwise. So I don't know. I feel like a broken record at this point. Uh, so I'll leave it there. Um, but some further thoughts and some more information and data points at least for grounding ourselves in reality when we're talking about BRICS, Marxism, you know, the stability of capitalism, Russia's, quote, success in the invasion of Ukraine. Oh, I almost forgot. Thank God I uh, looked at this part of my notes. Speaking of Russia, 
I would be extremely remiss not to mention this. Reuters story, and we got two stories on this. Cuba uncovers human trafficking of Cubans to fight for Russia and Ukraine. Okay, this is from two days ago, out of Havana. Cuba has uncovered a human trafficking ring that coerced its citizens to fight for Russia in the war in Ukraine, its foreign ministry said, adding that Cuban authorities were working to, quote, neutralize and dismantle the network. The statement from Cuba's foreign ministry late on Monday gave few details, but noted that the trafficking ring was operating both within Cuba, thousands of miles from Moscow, and in Russia. Quote, the Ministry of the Interior is working on the neutralization and dismantling of a human trafficking network that operates from Russia to incorporate Cuban citizens living there, and even some from Cuba, into the military forces participating in war operations in Ukraine. So I guess, uh, anyway, the, uh, the Cuban government statement said, Russia's defense ministry did not immediately respond to a Reuters request for comment. Russia last year announced a plan to boost the size of its armed forces by more than 30% to 1.5 million combat personnel, a lofty goal made harder by its heavy but undisclosed casualties in the war. In late May, a Russian newspaper in Ryazan City reported that several Cuban citizens had signed contracts with Russia's armed forces and had been shipped to Ukraine in return for Russian citizenship. It was not immediately clear if the Cuban Foreign Ministry statement was associated with the Ryazan report. Russia, which has strong political ties with communist-run Cuba, has long been an important destination for Cuban migrants seeking to escape economic stagnation at home. The defense ministers of Cuba and Russia earlier this year, which, by the way, you know, talking about sanctions and everything else, why is Cuba in the situation that it's in? The U.S. is trying to, like, starve it to death, basically. Otherwise, I mean, it would be a very different situation there. Anyway, continuing, uh, the defense ministers of Cuba and Russia earlier this year discussed the development of joint technical military projects at a meeting in Moscow. But the administration of Cuban President Miguel Diaz-Canel denies any involvement in the Ukraine conflict. Quote, Cuba is not part of the war in Ukraine, the foreign ministry said late on Monday. Cuba is acting and will act energetically against anyone who participates in any form of human trafficking for the purpose of recruitment of Cuban citizens as mercenaries to use arms against any country. Cuba said it had already begun prosecuting cases in which its citizens had been coerced into fighting in Ukraine. Quote, attempts of this nature have been neutralized and criminal proceedings have been initiated against people involved in these activities, the statement read. So that's the end of that article. I'm going to read this other one real quick. Um, I'm going to probably share this on the, on the channel too because this is significant. So this is from Al Jazeera. Cuba uncovers network trafficking Cubans to fight for Russia in Ukraine. Cuba says it has no part in the war in Ukraine and would act vigorously against anyone trafficking Cubans as fighters. Again, this is from the fifth two days ago. Cuba has uncovered a human trafficking ring that has coerced Cuban citizens to fight for Russia in the war in Ukraine, its foreign ministry said. Let's see if they're like, what if this is new information? I don't want to go uh, rereading the entire thing. Uh, Cuba has a firm and clear historical position against mercenarism and plays an active role in the United Nations in repudiation of this practice, the ministry added, according to an unofficial translation. The Russian government has not commented. All right, then there's the thing about Ryazan City again. There's just two more screens on this. Al Jazeera reported last year that the Russian government, through the Wagner Mercenary Force, had recruited Syrians to fight alongside Russian troops in Ukraine. Thousands across war-torn Syria had reportedly expressed an interest in signing up. By the way, that black space in the middle was just an ad that I cut out. In June, it was reported that an Iraqi citizen was killed fighting with Russia's Wagner Mercenary Force in Ukraine. The deceased, Abbas Abuthar Witwit, was recruited from a prison in Russia with the promise that his sentence would be commuted following his service in Ukraine. According to court papers seen by the Reuters news agency at the time, Witwit had been sentenced to four and a half years in prison on drug charges in July 2021 by a court in the Russian city of Kazan. Witwit was a first year student at a technical university in Russia at the time of his conviction. So there you go, Russia's war on drugs. Um, you go from being in a technical university to fighting in a mercenary group. All right, we're actually done now.
So we'll see what shakes out of that. But turning back to the chat for the remainder of the show, and I got about another 20 minutes here today before I got to go do something else. So apologies in advance to folks that I won't be able to get to in the chat. All right, so... If BRICS stands for peace among capitalists, it represents international capitalist cooperation against a global working class. Not a good thing. Absolutely, as communists, we have to always look at class interests first and foremost. And that's been the major um, push in here is imperialism is the major contradiction. And basically all class struggle within a country needs to be forgotten at this point. I do not agree. And that's basically the main... Um, you know, pseudo Marxist line in support of the Russian invasion of Ukraine is is pushing that. Russia has a developed military industrial complex. Why aren't they an empire? Yeah, of course. Well, I, you can look it up. I mean, there's various articles written trying to explain why Russia isn't imperialist. However, it is. And, and that's just the way it is. So <laughs> there's no way India and China will share a common currency. Yeah, they don't seem to get along very well. Oh, yeah, if you want to change your name on Patreon, go for it. That's, you know, totally fine. I think a lot of those names, too, are... Well, it depends. <laughs> Some of them are, are very specific, and there's probably only one individual by that name. You know, others are just like John, Jared, Jasmine, so... I think there's a tendency with online culture that infests the left with uh, where minor disagreements turn into Sino-Soviet splits, and yet again we fail to learn our lesson about knowing our enemy as being colonialism, capitalism, and racism. First, not petty disagreements. I think that the people you're talking about are terminally online uh, people who have like no connection to any real-world activity. They're not grounded. They don't touch grass. They never log off. And, you know, I mean, the revolution is not going to come from terminally online communists. It's just simply not. I'm doing what I'm doing here to try to put online, you know, educational resources that anybody can access and it's totally fine also if people are doing self-study because i mean where are you going to study this otherwise um online for significant periods of time but if you're not involved in labor unions and you know other kinds of uh, local boots on the ground work trying to build up class struggle um it's irrelevant you know it, terminally online opinions just don't matter in the end and people should sort of pinch themselves and remember that i think we need a massive upswell in class consciousness and struggle and I think a lot of these problems will get sorted out. But, you know, you got to remember, too, amid the whole history of Marxism, going back to like 1900, the German Social Democratic Party, the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, um, there have always been splits and wars and fights between, you know, the Bernsteins and the Luxembourgs and the, uh, you know, and the Kautskys and the Lenins. And, you know, and so on. There have always been these splits. You just have to go in kind of expecting it. But, yeah, I get it. People who are just terminally online, never log off, lose all perspective. Uh, yeah, they, they engage in, like, really bad behavior online. And uh, you do get people getting into ridiculous, um, non-productive kind of petty disagreements. I agree. Uh, some theory that is often neglected is stuff like Vicky Legion's constructive criticism and uh, inter-party struggle and how to be a good communist. Yeah, there are various um, tried and true theoretical works that speak to how to constructively disagree and get along with people who are you know, within the party organization. That said, I mean, there are renegades within parties, too. That's something that you have to expect. But yeah, not maybe not treating everyone like, uh, you know, the Benedict Arnold or Karl Kautsky or whatever, is um, I, I do see people losing perspective. And I think it's lack of just being grounded in any real world activity. So in other words, how to do principled struggle, how to avoid or cut through unprincipled struggle. Yeah, it's, it's important. I've sent several people your union playlist, essential to help them break into organizing. Yeah, there's a playlist on the channel, how to do union organizing. You know, it's tough, but it can be learned. Um, check it out. You know, it'll take you about 10 or 12 hours to listen to the whole thing. It's, you know, several different videos, but uh, it'll teach you a lot about the basics of union organizing. So 
and you know not everybody's up for being a leader on that but um leaders need supporters and followers you know being the first follower it can be just as important as being a leader and modeling getting behind that leader so you know uh study up know what's required and and do as much as you can long COVID is the reason so many people suck at driving these days i think honestly it, there's a lot of impairment going on and it's affecting people across the board um yeah i was just trying to do something involving uh dealing with a lot of strangers recently and uh my god it's like people have no sense anymore and i think um the long covid you know it, it's really taking a toll there it, this is a mass disabling event bottom line Uh, if anyone's looking for other Marxist-Leninist media that is also COVID-conscious, take a look at Work Stoppage Podcast. Their book club is doing many works on how to be an organizer right now, and they have lots of union contacts. Okay, good. I've never heard of them. I'll um, write that down. Work Stoppage Pod. I used to see people driving and say this motherfucker is about to kill somebody maybe one, once or twice a month. Now it's every damn day. Also, wearing a mask is the easiest thing to do. Just do it. The school year is just starting. Things are only going to skyrocket from here as far as COVID spread. Absolutely. There are people out here celebrating because the rate of inflation has slowed. Not even stopped, just slowed. I mean, and again, like this is a well-established cycle. So after this, there's going to be unemployment and then... Also, you know, student debt repayments and other pandemic exceptions are ending. Um, you know, the like the state extensions of medical care was rolled back with the ending of the pandemic emergency back in May. And so that's going to be, um, I think, definitely by next year, all gone, probably everywhere. And so you're going to have people facing more bills at the same time that sort of job openings are declining and wages are going to go down. Where do you think that's going to end up? You know, de uh, delinquency, default, foreclosures, then there's going to be more houses on the market. That's going to cause prices to come tumbling down. Uh, there's going to be all kinds of effects and it will be a big cascade, as, as it always is. You know, these people who are like, you know, learn basic economics. How about you learn basic economics or at least, you know, stop pretending to have amnesia about how the system works. Yet every time they do. Richard Wolff is not a revolution guy. Yeah, no kidding. He, like all other revisionists, is a reformist. Absolutely. The funny thing is he, uh, I've heard him state in an interview that he, um, you know, is a big fan of Rosa Luxemburg. Interesting, because she doesn't really support your points that you're teaching. Pro-capitalism is a cult. The invisible hand of the market is another deity. I feel like a lot of people would benefit on a crash course of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. Yeah, we did some stuff about Henrik Grossman's work a while ago. I want to say it was like live stream number 55. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Religion and cult, same difference. As somebody said, I feel like it's more like a religion because it's mainstream. Uh, I mean, in sociology, at least, the difference between a religion and a cult really is just size. So, yeah. I mean, cult has the connotation of being, uh, you know, like a smaller thing. But, um, yeah, technically, like sociologically, they're kind of basically the same. Just it's only a size difference. Amazing how Marx explained the rate of profits falling back when capitalism was just kind of starting. Well, it was already apparent at that time. Since I've become homeless, I've switched to public transport. It's made my life better. Yes, it's extremely frustrating and angering when people light up blues on the train. But uh, overall, it's made me walk more, meet more people, and not be trapped in cars for too long. Yeah, I mean, when I had my first experience using more public transit, I, I felt the same way. Cars are very isolating, yeah. If history rhymes and we have a Great Depression-style crash, can we hypothesize subsequent massive World War II-style militarization and war mobilization? Yeah, I mean, uh, you already have sort of the sides lining up, like BRICS versus NATO kind of thing. It's not developed enough at that point, and it could go in different directions, but yeah. Another purpose of wars is to destroy capital. Um, that that's another way of preserving the system. So when I was actually, you know what, I think I just answered my own question. When I was saying, you know, when quantitative easing stops working, 
that's where destroying most of the infrastructure of the world comes in. That's how they reset the clock on capitalism. So yeah, that, that is exactly why. Atlanta is the future of many, many cities in the U.S. Yeah, I may cover this in the next stream or so, but I think Balt I was looking at a story, Baltimore is also um, uh, setting, they have a similar cop city project on the way. There's like a huge police um, and, and other first responder training center. And that may be a way that they're making it more palatable of like putting in other like EMS stuff. But uh, yeah, Baltimore is trying to do a cop city too. Working on getting an alternative passport because of this. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's not a not a terrible idea. It's hard to get out of the U.S. I mean, it, it can be. It depends where you're looking to go, but yeah, it can be hard. Well, the unfortunate thing about the unmitigated spread of deadly disease is it's really global. There's not really many countries at all right now um, doing like you know adequate COVID protections. Uh, the U.S. is particularly bad, but um, I don't think there's any really good countries right now. Getting my Ecuadorian citizenship since my father was born there. There you go. If the feds are going after anarchists, MLs are going to have to make solidarity a matter of strategic policy. Differences aside, this is racist policy targeting um, and oppressing a technically progressive leftist section of the population. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the broad U.S. left is not really at a point where, you know, we're, we've had um, significant sort of like vanguard leadership of a revolutionary struggle. And then there was a backstabbing. You know, people um, are getting and a lot of these people are just getting termed as anarchists anyway. No doubt there are some anarchists in there. No doubt. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think uh, so solidarity absolutely is important. You know, it's one thing to have a theoretical difference or even point out the sort of historical failures of anarchism. But um, that's an issue that, you know, especially in the more focused the issue is, the easier it is to join forces and make that alliance. And especially on an issue like that, that's a no brainer. Literally the dirtiest case in a while. Absolutely. There needs to be a strong communist presence at the next Defend the Forest week of action, showing our solidarity and struggle. I agree, that would be a great thing to do. In the words of George Jackson, repression, do you see the effect it has on the uncommitted? Comrade, repression exposes. <laughs> if I was Putin's mom, this not would have... If I was Putin's mom, this would not have happened. Yeah, the um, I think that was an actual liberal take out there on Twitter somewhere. Boy, boy, do liberals not understand things. Again, you know, before I became a communist, I didn't understand things as much either. I'm still learning, too. But, wow, you look back on, on the liberal stuff and it's just like, these people are living in complete confusion and ignorance. Wouldn't multipolarity necessarily lead to world war like last time? Yeah, I mean, the whole problem is, like, NATO wasn't letting Russia in the club so much, you know? Not that specifically they wanted to join NATO, although there were talks about that in the late 90s, but that Russia wasn't sort of being recognized as an equal. I mean, that was, like, part of the point, is there was that conflict there, and, yeah, that would just probably grow. BRICS has some similarities with the old non-aligned countries, but the major difference is there isn't a socialist bloc, with Cuba being by far the best on internationalism. Yeah, so uh, commenting on um, the role of world war uh, to destroy capital and then allow for reinvestment via imperialism to reap super profits. Uh, DPRK had closed borders at least up until recently because of COVID. Yes, that is true. Um, like the only reason the U.S. quote gave independence to the Philippines after World War II was to then force it to get imperialized even more by the U.S. forever when rebuilding after the war. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, I, I don't know. I mean, that basically answers my question about uh, when I was working on the thing for the offline supplement that I haven't yet recorded. 
That is what they're going to do. They're going to have a world war to reset the system by destroying a lot of capital. Neocolonialism is a hell of a system. And uh, that's a great point to end. Thanks, everybody, for showing up, helping make this stream what it is. We're going to call it there, and you can expect to see this uh, hopefully up by Saturday, Sunday. At least 105 will be up by Saturday. See you in the next video.